background by myself. I, I have a background in engineering. I got a master's degree in 93. I founded CIPCO in 93 to service and support stereolithography and FDM equipment as a third party supplier of services and materials. Um, in 2002, I founded Envision Tech uh, to uh, develop a technology that's based on DLT printing. And uh, I have over 100 patents issued worldwide in my name. And uh, for that, uh, I was awarded the Entrepreneur of the Year in the US uh, for technology in 2015. So um, in talking about 3D printing, there's been a lot of hype, a lot of up, a lot of down, and hopefully it will go back up. But uh, there's a lot of stories about where is the value in 3D printing. As we try to clarify it, and after looking at it myself for the last 25 years, if I have to really define what is 3D printing, I would put the value in high value add and mass customization. Uh, the most brilliant thing about 3D printing allowed the flattening of the global economic platform. So labor is no longer part of the manufacturing cost when you introduce 3D printing into your manufacturing process. And just a simple example, uh, three crowns can be done by hand by a certified dental technician that costs an average of 35 euros per hour into the UK. 30 crowns can be done per hour with a 3D printer with the same technician. So all of a sudden your cost went from 10 euros per crown to about one euro per crown. And that eliminated in the dental space the idea of having a, a, a cost associated with the labor. And that's why no matter where, whether you're doing a crown in China or you're doing a crown in the UK, the labor cost is no longer an issue. And that allowed what is called the flattening of the global economic field. So that's really what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about value add to mass customization, where we are today, and what's the next big thing. Because really everybody wants to know what's the next big thing. A little bit of idea about the beginning. So uh, of course we know uh, Chuck, Dr. Chuck Holnam, he got his PhD, uh, and uh, my good friend Scott Crump from uh, the FDM uh, Technology, and again Chuck from the SLA, uh, both got to meet him at an early age when I was installing my uh, first machine at uh, General Motors. And for those of you who don't know what LOM is, it's laminated object manufacturing. You take sheets of paper, you glue them together, and you basically start with a tree, you get paper, then you take the paper and you put it back in any tree shape that you want. That's what L1 technology is all about. Here's some of the pictures. This is a prototype that was printed in 1993, my handwriting 1993, for a 1996 Corvette at General Motors. Uh, and some of the, the parts that, uh, uh, some of the consumer product. So my, my first, interesting story in 3D printing uh, as it relates to LOM is we were gluing papers together and we were cutting with a laser to make a 3D part and uh, in 95, 96 I got a call from a company called Ansel Edmund and Ansel Edmund is a manufacturer of gloves and I'll say quietly condoms and they wanted to do some customization at that point in time which was they wanted to print small, medium, large, and extra large hands, and small, medium, large, and extra large things that are used for condoms. So um, I went ahead and I printed them, and I shipped them on Thursday. They got in on Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon. The engineering manager, Ansel Edmund, had left. So they took the parts, they put them on the credenza behind his desk, and it was a beautiful sunny weekend in Ohio. Monday came in and I got a call from the engineering manager. He said, well, we have a little problem. The parts were not stable over time. And the moral of the story is until today, when we do 3D printing, we're trying to maintain stability over time for those parts. So that was my first experience with having a stability over time. Uh, back to my story, uh, General Motors. These are actually pictures from General Motors that I saved. When I walked to General Motors in 1993 to install my first LOM 2030, there was the SLA 
that was installed uh, by 3D Systems and Chalks FDM machine. The interesting thing about the L1 2030, of course, was that it was 20 inches by 30 inches. So it was the largest built platform for its time in 1993. So that's when I got to meet Chalk and, I, uh, and, and Scott Crum. Uh, so after learning about all these technologies, I started developing in 1998 the first DLP printer in uh, my living room. So if you can see here, this is my living room and that's the carpet in my living room. You can see the very advanced and really very thin CRT monitor uh, back there. Um, and, and I also started working on the perfunctory system. This is the first DLP printer that I sold uh, to Cobra Golf uh, that made the Midback Bertha gloves uh, at, uh, in 2004. That's me and, and, and my partner in time, Alexander Schmoling, and that's the first printer, believe it or not, uh, a Kushnet uh, now, which was, used to be Cobra Golf, still runs the machine today in Crosby, California. Uh, also, what became the standard in the industry in DLP printing, where thousands and thousands of machines are currently installed today, uh, is the desktop 3D printer, which is the per factory, the personal factory. 2000 to 2002, we worked with Freiburg University to develop what is now a big deal. Everybody talks about it. It's the biofabrication, it's printing kidneys, printing organs, creating cells, and that's our first generation bioplotter that was sold in 2002 to the University of Vienna. And uh, later we upgraded that, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, in when I started with DLP printing, I could only print very small parts, but we were able to make a lot of penetration and create some disruption in many different manufacturing platforms that I'll talk about. But I also wanted to build very large, accurate parts, and the only way to do it was to come up with something that would compete, and, and that led to the 3SP technology, which used a laser diode, which is a much lower cost than the current SLA machine that uh, uses the solid state laser, or diode pump solid state laser. This is a story that I'll walk through to give you an idea how mass customization disrupted industries, and these are industries that we were able to disrupt, and I'll talk more about how I went Vache in jewelry, and that led to the creation of what is called customized 3D printing of uh, jewelry today, the heating aid market with Mike Jones at Phonak, Livewell and Aloroma from Volkswagen in 2007. Where are we today? This is where we are today. There's a lot of high performance printing machines that are actually professional grade. disrupted manufacturing. Talk about the heating aid market, we'll talk more about these, um, uh, these different industries. And you can see the massive adoption by all these different companies that are very global and large size companies in terms of whether you're talking about jewelry, MCAT, dental, and heating aid. So this is where we are now. This is what we have been able to do in terms of disrupting some of the markets in order to deliver solutions that are end usable. Watching and my first show in 2003 in the U.S. Uh, it was the first jewelry show that I did with a DLP printer. A guy, a guy walks up to me and says, "Can you print this ring?" And I said, "Yeah, it's going to take four hours." He hands me the file. He comes back in four hours. He looks at the ring. He says, "Can I buy this machine right now and take it with me?" I said, "It's the first day of the show. It's my prototype, and it's too big. You can't take it back with you on the plane." He said, "Yes, yes, yes. I have my private jet." I'm like, I guess, okay, I'll take your order and then you can take the machine at the end of the show. 
what this led to is a very big deal in customization again. One out, every woman wants her own custom ring, her custom designs, and every woman is going to drag the fiance over to the jewelry show, to the jewelry store, and they're going to walk and they're going to look at the jewelry and she's going to say, honey, I don't like any of this. And the owner is going, wait, she just walked over a million dollars worth of inventory and I'm not making a sale. So one of the ideas was, let's design something that the jewelry owner can actually customize for that person and let them try it within an hour. Just like we had glasses in an hour, let's do jewelry in an hour. So what did we do? We came up, we talked to a company called GemVision, who designed a software that could be used by a, a jeweler who is very old and doesn't know a lot about technology. And instead of actually, come on, let's look at all the jewelry, why don't we sit down, have a cup of coffee, let's build your own ring. So we built the own ring. We put the ring together, we built the own ring, and then we delivered to the jeweler a small printer that he can print your custom ring in one hour in plastic, of course we're going to paint it and then we're going to put a zirconia on it which is what's your budget is it a half a carat great i'm going to print one for half a carat i'm going to print one for three quarters of a carat because as soon as i put the three quarters of a carat she's going to say honey don't you think this looks better so the sale will happen and will upsell so that was an interesting thing with the with the uh with the uh, jewelry one with the heating gate market mike jones walks up to me at uh you know all he says what does this printer do? I said, anything. He says, can you print a shell? I said, yes. He says, we print every single, we do every single shell today with Fona, which is a four billion euro company. We do those by hand. And I said, okay. He says, why don't you send me one of those machines to Chicago? Send it to Chicago in 2005. Today, over 100 systems at Fona in 19 countries Using the perfactory, deliver heating aids that are custom fit, that are specific to a specific patient. And that's another story where the heating aid industry was disrupted with the use of the DLP perfactory system. Jim Glidewell owns the largest single U.S. dental lab in the U.S. He has 3,500 people in two buildings in Long Beach, California. He came up with 20 people, didn't know who he was, but he was a genius because he always looked at 3D printing to put it in the dental space. He came up to a show at TCT, and he said to me in 2008, can you do crowns? Can you print wax up crowns? And that started 3D printing. Today, Envision Pack machines print over 11 million custom coping and crowns in the U.S. alone. Glidewell, Jim Glidewell's lab has over 30 machines. Each one of them produces an average of 400 gold pings and crowns every day. That's disruptive. That's what 3D printing does. It delivers value. You're not going to hear me telling you that you're going to have a printer in every room in your house. No, that's not the kind of printing that we're looking at. We're looking at printing to disrupt manufacturing. Um, and then finally, an interesting story uh, about, again, how you open up Arctic. Uh, both Wedex uh, made custom uh, uh, jets, and uh, they used to prototype the jets that go on the, uh, to jet water on the windshield of the car. And uh, I got a file from the guy who owns the company, and he said, can you print this? It's, a, it's the jet that plugs into the, uh, the front of the car to get the water on the windshield. And I said, yes, of course I can do that. We printed it. It took four hours to do four of them. And then I called him. I sent him the part. He said, how long did it take to make? I said, I printed four of them in four hours. He says, no way. He said, it takes 16 hours to machine a prototype on a CNC machine uh, for the nozzle that jets the water. I said, he said, here's what you do. You overnight the machine, the perfectly, from Michigan to Maryland, we're gonna put it in, you're gonna start the machine, you're gonna walk away, come back in four hours, don't talk to me, clean the part, walk to my desk and get a check for the machine. And that's how we got the sale at Bowles for Weddings. So those are some of the stories that actually show how 3D printing really impacted manufacturing, whether from a prototyping standpoint, 
when we're talking about both poetics or whether from a, an end user. Um, finally, the most impressive thing, and I think one of the things that would really deliver value uh, over time in the medical space is the biofather. There's a lot of people, when I talk about the future of 3D printing, I look at uh, Dr. Shah at the University, uh, Northwestern University with her uh, fourth generation bioplotter who's doing a lot of amazing things with what I call printable inks. She's loading the inks with metals, she's doing a lot of stuff on, this, uh, on the fuel cells, but most interestingly that she was able to uh, develop lately was the introduction of graphene. The graphene introduction would allow printing of real body parts. There's a lot of people that talk about body parts, but I didn't really kind of felt the truth about that until I started seeing what graphene can do in terms of immersible, uh, implantable electronics. So what it does, it does regrow and it does replace nervous tissue. And you'll see more of that as we develop the technology. Dr. Rocky Tuan was the first one to actually 3D print cartilage. He did a lot of cartilage printing using the Envision Tech technology. You know, osteoarthritis is a very big problem and we're trying to deal with it. And you know, all the issues that come with it and people trying to fix it. And he's the first one that was able to deal with the joint injuries and the cartilage degeneration. And you'll see more of that coming out in the future. Columbia University last year did something amazing. There's a the problem with the meniscus. Everybody at some point in time will have either a destroyed meniscus or a torn meniscus and you go to the doctor and the doctor is going to say, okay, the only thing I can do is either remove it, shoot you some cortisone, pull out the infection in your leg. It's, it's, been, it's been quite painful, that experience. And Dr. Mao at Columbia University was able to actually create a scaffold and shoot a cell into it and grow it in a reactor to build a full, fully integrated, I never got the laser by the way, uh, the, 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 the meniscus that, was a, that he was able to put into the uh, leg and it was a very successful, uh, and that is some of the things that you will see coming out, fixing of the meniscus, improving people's lives. What's in the future? Everybody talks about carbon nanotubes and how they can impact the mechanical properties and all the great things that you can do. What I know about carbon tubes so far with the bioplotter is that the fact that it can create a 3D electrical network stimulates the cells. In the matrix, it stimulates the cells and that really promotes a lot of growth. That would allow, so if somebody talks about nanotubes, you can see, if you look very closely, we looked at different concentration of carbon nanotubes in the matrix while we're building a, a scaffolding with cells in it and the nature of it, the conductivity of it, allows for a faster and more successful growth of the cell, uh, especially the bone uh, cell. Metals, again, everybody's talking about metals, there's a lot of hype about metals, especially with the G getting involved in it. I'm going to show you a little different side of the metals. Everyone will at some point in time have an implant. Unfortunately, every implant in the world is coming from titanium. What's the problem with titanium? It's very strong material. Everybody that puts a titanium implant will at some point in time have to replace it because it destroys everything about it. What does it do? It's, it, 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 it takes away from the strength of the bones, so it gets loose with time. So the idea here is, why do we have to do titanium? We're gonna take nickel, which is currently used in stems, put it with titanium, and adjust the mixture for that patient in order to have the mechanical properties that match the surrounding areas so that we don't destroy with the implant everything else. And that's an interesting thing because it's been what So 3D printing is giving you a custom mechanical energy implant that sits in the right place and will last forever. And that's some of the work. It, unlike titanium that steals the load, it does not. It has very good shape memory. So again, when we talk about metals, the mixing of titanium 
and nickel to deliver a customized fixation that is specific to the area on the body. Because as you know, different areas have different mechanical properties and therefore let's print implants that are custom specific to that patient. I, just a, a quick overview, some of the things that we're looking at, you know, it just came out. Um, I know that the 4D printing of dielectric elastomer actuators and the inflatable silicone structure, what is called the 4D printing, uh, is still in the early stages, but it's getting there. 3D printed custom optics, I think that's another area that's coming out right now in 3D printing, and it can significantly impact the industry. I can tell you from my own background that when I started, because Envision Tech was the first company to deliver an industrial DLP system, it was very, very expensive to go out and try to get custom optics. It's a very expensive idea. And the idea of actually doing your prototyping or printing 50 or 100 pieces of custom optics is a great idea and I think we're we'll gonna see more growth in that area. I think that's an area where's the next big thing. Um, we've seen a lot of fashion shows and well, it didn't really get that far, but a lot of fashion shows about 3D printing uh, articles of clothing, but they all use flames. The next thing that's interesting is the electrospinning process where they use uh, high voltage in order to build actual clothing, which is not woven textile. So that's another area that a lot of people are working on and we're looking at it uh, in terms of growth areas. So what's the next big thing? Everybody's talking about metals. Well, here's a little fact, that every single aerospace company in the world, including GE, spends 50% or more of their budgets on carbon composites, not on metals. Only 15% of the budgets are spent on metals. And the rest of the budget for the aerospace is spent on something else. So, where we should go and what we should look at in order to be disruptive in the professional industrial market is carbon composites. 50% of the car volume is plastic. So if we can actually 3D print efficiently composites, we can reduce the car weight by $5,000. According to the Department of Energy, that's probably the most disruptive thing that you can get today in 3D printing is carbon composites. I can print 3D carbon composites, I'm gonna do a lot with it. Um, one other thing that we're, we're very closely looking at and working at in R&D is how it can imp the mechanical property can significantly impact the performance of the 3D printed part. So if you look at, here's, we have a, a set of properties that relate to thermoplastics that are coming out of the infused deposition modeling process. Here's the photopolymer chemistry that comes out of uh, uh, stereolithography, DLP, 3SP technology. And now when we're looking at carbon composite or what I call carbon reinforced polymer systems that would allow us to move the mechanical properties up there so we can have high temperature, high impact strength, and at the same time maintain very high quality. Um, some of the parts that we did for to check what is a, a 3D injection molded part that is printed with a high fill of uh, nano carbon fiber. We got some amazing results. We don't want to share them now, but we will share them in the future. But the most interesting thing about this is when you print a 3D composite part and you actually put a nail through it and just try to tap it, unlike any plastic that we've been able to do the same thing, you will get an indentation in the surface. But even though we hammered it, the impact strength was so high that it did not do anything as far as bending the surface or damaging the surface. And I think that when we look at where 3D printing is going, probably the most interesting area to look at is uh, composites. And uh, predominantly, that's my story. In the end, I'd like to tell you a little bit as, 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 as I see this, after being in the business since 1993, 3D printing, most interesting idea is, now people say, instead of saying, can we machine it, we've been able to move to, from can we machine it in an engineering group in an engineering department to can we 3D print it, that's the first one. The second one is 3D printed 
3D printing enabled something very important, which is mass customization. Mass customization and 3D printing is, is a very interesting uh, concept that nobody can take away from 3D printing. Eliminating labor costs as part of the overall manufacturing uh, cost, which flattens the global economy and allows us to compete everywhere, is a very big deal. And uh, finally, the one thing that I want to leave you with is, a lot of people talk about the size of the 3D printing market. How big is the market? And a lot of people come up with articles and a lot of analysts talk a lot of things. But here's one thing I will leave you with. From a guy who's been in it since 1993, guy I probably have impacted over 6,000 installations so far globally, whether in the medical field or in the MCAT field or in the dental field, etc. The answer is nobody knows. There's always once a month somebody that comes and knocks on our door and have a new 3D printing application that he can disrupt the manufacturing process. And for that, it is a great industry. It is a great time to be in this industry. It will continue to grow. And I wish you all luck and thank you again. Please, my final pitch, visit our booth at C14. I want to make sure I say that. Thank you again.